Greetings, Bradley Jersak here from SSU, and we're going to be introducing the topic of existentialism today. The class is Quest for Meaning, and that's a good description of what the existentialists were about and why they can be valuable to us today, especially in an era where so much deconstruction has gone on that we're not always sure about even whether meaning will be left at all. And so this is a very important topic, but we've also got those who have addressed it in a really thorough and thoughtful way. Existentialism is really more of a movement than a philosophy, and it was primarily literary, and there was a lot going on in terms of the critique of culture, of society, of the church, of government, and so on. But really, the essence of existentialism is very similar to what we would think of today as deconstruction, in that it gave itself permission to question the status quo, to critique the direction the herd was running in willy-nilly and without a lot of mindfulness. And so the existentialists give us the gift of a deeply uh, thoughtful critique, both of society itself, but some of the most powerful early psychological literature in terms of, well, we could say navel-gazing, but actually... They really were insightful in terms of what goes on in the human heart, in the conditions and the context into which we're thrown. I'm going to begin with some foundational voices from the 19th century. They would not have been called existentialists at the time. That language comes later. But they really are the precursors and the founders and the sort of grandfathers of existentialism. Uh, the three we'll begin with. Soren Kierkegaard, that's a caricature of him on the right. Soren Kierkegaard was a Dane. He's called the father of existentialism. Uh, he was from a Christian kind of background, or rather Christendom, in the time when Denmark was sort of assuming Christianity uh, just by birthright. If you were born a citizen of Denmark, you were a Christian. And as a Christian, there was a social expectation to participate in the life of the church, really as an assumption. And Kierkegaard worried about this. He thought that a lot of what we see as Christianity or Christendom uh, was had very little or nothing at all to do with following Jesus. He didn't really care if you were a Christian. He wanted to know, will you be Christian? What would that look like? And, and so he gives some pretty scathing critiques of how the church has failed in that and how those in the church are really kind of what he called a herd. And he said, you are responsible for your own life. You don't get to follow the herd at the final judgment. You are going to stand accountable for your own life, how you lived it, and the choices you made. Uh, in this sense, he's also a father of individualism, which becomes actually kind of radical and even toxic individualism later. But he really did make a point. If you are uh, going to live in this world as just part of whatever society is telling you to do, pressuring you to do, expecting to, you to do, you're going to end up saying things like, I was just following orders. And that does not wash for Kierkegaard. He believes that you need to step out in faith yourself and in fact um, in so doing you know your ethics then are something you are accountable for you can't blame others for your missteps you have to you have to stand before God someday so you have to stand before life and death today so this is a very brief section on Kierkegaard if you get my book out of the embers I have quite a thorough chapter on him and I was that was done with the help of Stephen Backhouse and if you can get Stephen Backhouse's book on Kierkegaard that's probably the best biography that's available today and so Kierkegaard he's a Christian existentialism existentialist in in this way your existence matters that would that that's a way we could talk about this existence ism your existence in this world is your entry point to everything we don't start by believing in God and then apply that to life. That might look good logically, but in terms of like you're born somewhere, you're born to someone, you're born in a context with maybe faith or no faith, but whatever faith comes, it will come 
within your real life, your choices, your faith, your agency. Um, so that's Kierkegaard. We also have Dostoevsky. Fyodor Dostoevsky was a Russian, and he lived roughly the same time, but he wrote novels in Russia. Oh, Kierkegaard was writing a lot of books too, uh, articles, essays, under many names and from different points of view. Dostoevsky is primarily a novelist. He was a novelist who, as a young man, experienced a tremendous trauma when it was discovered that he was participating with people who were associated with revolution. And I'm, I'm not so sure there was, there was a real um, involvement there, but what happens is he is put up against a firing squad. And at the last moment, he is saved from the firing squad. But this kind of was so traumatizing. It did a couple of things. One is it began a life of seizures, but also out of that came this kind of genius, very deep, deep um, novel writing. And I would say, you know, his his great work, The Brothers Karamazov, which was just too long to read for this course, um, is regarded by many as the greatest novel in history of all time, The Brothers Karamazov. But also, you know, Crime and Punishment would be quintessential Dostoevsky, where you're getting a, a quite an intense kind of plot line, but also within it, powerful characters, um, sometimes actually so loaded with pathos, you you wouldn't believe that they're true to life until you meet Russian people. And then you're like, oh yeah, this is how they are. And and um, so Dostoevsky is going to use his novel to explore faith, to critique uh, religion, to examine um, themes like nationalism and even watch how we've got over the course of, of the 19th century, the rise of a kind of progressivism that will become very destructive with the Bolshevik revolution and after that, um, uh, Stalin. And so Dostoevsky sees this coming. He especially writes about that journey, uh, sort of from classical Christendom through liberalism into nihilism and a kind of violent progressivism. He, he writes about that in a book called The Possessed. And it's a little bit then like Kierkegaard's herd. Dostoevsky picks that up and he uses the parable of the Gadarene demoniac and how the herd becomes possessed and rushes into the sea. And he says, this is what's happening in my nation and what can stop it. But it's not just on the grand scales of society. He's going to explore in the book we're reading the, the intense agony the angst, as Kierkegaard would call it, but in, within oneself and when, how, we can, how we can come to wholeness. Now, those, those two guys, they, they do connect with Jesus. Um, but we also have Nietzsche, who was a German philosopher, writer, essayist. And he's sometimes called the father of postmodernism. And uh, like the other two, he believed in the importance of individual responsibility, individual freedom, and the generation of one's own value system. And so he does not believe that there is a law from on high that comes down, or even virtues that we participate in external to ourselves. Rather, he says that, that uh, your value system comes from within, and you're going to you, you're going to need to look at that because if you don't. Uh, you you can end up where you have a meaningless life. And so we have the term nihilism. Some pronounce it nihilism. Well, he wasn't a nihilist. His warning was that if we don't establish meaning, values, and rise above our resentments to live as responsible people in this world, you will end up in a kind of nihilism where life is meaningless and and we're not hired hardwired that way. So if, if you... Uh, if you end up in nihilism, you will be susceptible then to the kind of um, the kind of buffoons or very dangerous people like a Hitler will come along, or somebody who then gathers up what he calls the last men, which is his version of the herd. And so, don't join the herd, but but it, you will join the herd if if you live a meaningless life. That said, he doesn't think the solution is to become 
to become Christian. In fact, he regards Christianity as problematic, but also just his idea of of uh, of Jesus is very weak willed, and he thinks we need something more of a Superman or Ubermensch, as he calls it. So these are the three foundational voices as I see it. Um, next, we go into the 20th century and there's a lot of existentialists, some who adopt the label and some who refuse it, but clearly are part of the same movement. So Albert Camus, for example, the author of The Plague, he would have denied that he's an existentialist, but in many ways he's quintessential. <laughs> and uh, he was he was a Frenchman born and raised in, in Algeria, which was a French colony in North Africa. It's the setting of this novel. But then um, also he's around during the time of, of where he sees Nazism rolling through um, and the kind of fascist herd that is uh, that, that requires us to respond. And so are we going to undergo this plague of ideas? Uh, or are we going to join a re the resistance? He becomes part of the French resistance, actually. And he is called the father of absurdism. And this is the idea that, you know, one element that is so important to understanding existence is that we are born into situations that are absurd and spe specifically suffering. And so the idea with with absurdism is in a moment, you you get these flashes that that life is not this machine that works based on transactions. It's not a, a mechanical kind of a vending machine that, you know, good people experience good things, bad people experience bad things. It doesn't work that way, and especially not with death. Um, death and the things leading to death are so random that, that you could never take a theodicy, that is a way to rationalize the problem of, of suffering in this world. It's... And then to be able to look absurdity in the eye and, and not turn away, turn your face to the wall in despair, but how to live bravely, courageously in that and what it is to be human. Um, you know, Jean-Paul Sartre, now he would have identified as an existentialist. He's a French fellow and um, I, he's super famous and you're supposed to read him if you're into existentialism. I, I just don't have tons of patience for him. And that's because his kind of uh, sense of absurdity really, um, I'm not even sure how you can uh, work with meaning around that, but he has this fantastic little book. Um, he, one of his sayings was, was uh, hell is other people. So he has this little booklet or a short story that has been a play um, about three people in a drawing room, and that's going to be hell. So instead of burning in flames forever somewhere, you find out you find yourself in a fairly comfortable drawing room with two other people, and you're going to have to stay with them forever. And you kind of don't like them. And in fact, it's designed that they will push your buttons. And you can kind of see what he's saying. But on the other hand, that's the very opposite of Jesus, who says, where two or three are gathered, in my name, I'm in the midst of them. So I suppose the idea is if you're, if you're gathered uh, in in kind of the the atheistic approach that he would have taken, that would be kind of hellish perhaps, or maybe maybe not if you believed in love. So I don't always really track with Sartre. And I'm like, you know, we have more important things to read. I could have given you something by him. Nah. Um, we're not going to get time to study Viktor Frankl, but he was a German, a, a Jewish Holocaust sur survivor, a brilliant psychologist. <clears throat> and he wrote a book called Man's Quest for Meaning profound, profound existentialist work. It's worth reading. It's also worth looking him up on YouTube because you're going to see some old black and white movie reels of, of him speaking, strong accent, very insightful, very funny, uh, the dry humor of someone, <laughs> you know, the dark, dry humor of a post-Holocaust Jew who had, he was really able to track um, this quest for meeting in humanity, and in that sense, very much in the existentialist stream and a helpful voice. Um, as you've already noticed, then, we've got a range of existentialists, even terms of worldview and faith. So you've got Christian existentialists, that would be like Dostoevsky and Kierkegaard, uh, super critical of, of 
the Christianity as an ideology, but absolutely uh, call us to follow Jesus. And then you've got agnostics where, well, we're not so sure, right? So Albert Camus would have been an agnostic where he's not committed to a particular creed or dogma or idea of God, but he's also not entirely hostile. And one of the reasons we know that is because for whatever reason, he just, he said, Simon Weil is the brightest spirit of our age. And he was really very fascinated by her and her works and kind of a devotee. In fact, when he was to receive the Nobel Prize, uh, he went and found himself in an apartment that, that they had lived in. And he sat there and he meditated for 30 minutes before going on to get his his uh, Nobel Prize. So there's something going on with him where uh, he's not just hostile to faith. He's not a person of faith, but he did have a North Star. And that North Star seems to be around a kind of humanism that had ultimately ultimately goes back to the Christian humanism of Erasmus in the 16th century, although I don't know that he ever says that. It just appears to me very congruent as a kind of, if you think about a um, to be human really matters to him, and this is his version of existentialism, existentialism. and you, you see it very powerfully in the plague novel. And then you've got the atheist existentialism, Sartre and and. And Nietzsche, who's who's just utterly hostile, but he's he's kind of good for us. If we take him in small doses, it's like drinking salt water, you know, to induce vomiting of the toxins in your system that and poison you. But if you if you have too much salt water, you begin to hallucinate and get sick, and you can even die. And he did. Of course, the death rate's a hundred percent, so that's kind of not a surprise. But how he died was was quite tragic. So the atheist kind of existentialism. So you have that whole range, right? So we've got Kierkegaard, Christian critic of the religious church, Dostoevsky, the orthodox existentialist of the what, and he's a critic of the Western church from Russia. Um, Nietzsche, scathing critic of Christ and Christianity, Camus, agnostic humanist, admirer of Ve, and then Sartre, the atheist critic of any kind of essence, including God. His big thing was um, existence precedes a uh, essence. And I should pause there then to talk about that for a little bit, because it is very, very important to the existentialist in general. So then here's the idea. You've got essence. Think about essence as um, God, as being, um, as virtues, things that stand outside of us and, and they give life and meaning, and meaning to us. The existentialists, though, they would say existence precedes essence. Now, for someone like, so in, in other words, someone like Sartre would just say, well, there is no God. Or um, Nietzsche might say, there, if, there's, if there are the gods, there are our own creation. But, but, and so they kind of negate being or law or essence. Altogether, and they're like, your whole life is existence. You live here and now, and that's what you need to focus on, and that's where we f discover meaning. It's inside of our existence, and there's no essence beyond us. Well, the Christian existentialists, they would, they, they would disagree. Of course there's a God. Of course there's being beyond us. Of course there's virtues that we need to tap in. But for them, it's more epistemological. And that's to, epistemology is just how we know. So they would say, while there is a God, we, we encounter that God in the context of our existence. There are laws that give sense to the universe. We encounter them in our existence as we live real life and we discover gravity or we discover prayer or we discover it's a... So, so existence for them still does precede essence, but it's, it's not, it doesn't negate it. It's just like, how did you come to know God? Well, you... It, it was not an egg that hatched in the sky and came down to you. No, you, you in your real life somehow came to faith and you went through the doorway of, of a real church, a real family, a real life. And through that doorway, then we, we come to see um, eternal truth. So that's, again, it would be like Sartre and Nietzsche would say, there is no eternal truth. There's you and you make your own truth up. 
Kierkegaard, Dostoevsky said, of course there's a truth. And that truth is Jesus. And But you discover that truth by following him. So follow him. And, and so for existentialists, existence precedes essence. All right, so we're going to expand on this a little bit more. Here are some of the major themes then. And as you've seen in the videos when, that I've asked you to watch in the syllabus, there are, there are uh, different ways to talk about many themes. So I've distilled them down. This is not exhaustive at all. But um, we start with existence. I already said it. Existence ism. Existence matters, and it shouldn't be assumed. We should be mindful of existence. We should be um, embedded in life fully in a way that our eyes are wide open to what's happening around us, what's happening in us, what's happening in others, and that we would live with that in mind. And out of that, next point is, is meaning. What gives our lives meaning? And they, they're always asking us. It's a quest for meaning. And, and they have different responses to that question and probably multiple responses where, where they would ask you, what gives your life meaning? How did meaning come about? But they want you to know that existence is meaningful. And, uh, you know, I, it, it, from that point of view, John 10.10 10 makes a lot of sense. Thief who steals, kills, and destroys meaning from your life. But I, you know, Jesus Christ, have come that you would have life and that more abundant, that you'd have a meaningful existence. And by following me, that will be a byproduct. And uh, so that's something maybe Kierkegaard would say. By following Jesus, you'll experience meaning in your real life existence. Uh, Sartre or... or or Nietzsche would say, well, no, follow yourself, follow your own heart, do your own thing, make up your own rules. And when you do, you are going to make the path that you're walking. And so, uh, but they both, they both see that we're made for meaning. They all tend to focus on the individual as over against any system, religion, or herd. And I've already covered that a little bit uh, under Kierkegaard, but this idea that the individual matters the individual in the midst of a system, in the midst of a church, in the midst of a movement, um, the individual matters. And so, so this, can, this can go radically wrong, and it has. A kind of individual that le ism that leads to alienation and isolation. It can also be very grandiose. I'm special and the rules don't apply to me. The all, there's a lot of ways individualism can go wrong, but um, I find a lot of help from Martin Buber, who you're studying in other courses, and Buber's idea of the individual versus the person. And so he might even say there is no such thing as the individual. We develop personhood in relationship to, in our I-thou relationships. It is in relationship. It is in the two or three gathered. It is in my life um, with the other that I that my personhood actually develops. And so, you know, if you you have these uh, Romanian babies who were orphaned and left in cribs uh, in orphanages, and they didn't get eye contact, they didn't get held, they didn't get touch, and and their brains didn't develop. And they become feral, feral, and 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 this is what perhaps Buber means by the our personhood requires the other, and yet even in that you are a person, you're not just a cog in a system, you're not just a a, a bum in a pew, you're not just a pig in a herd, you you are a person, and so I think that's a very advanced form of kind of the existentialism that took a step past. Uh, where Kierkegaard had started. They're really into freedom, really into the responsibility that comes from that freedom. And they talk, the existentialisms talk about um, um, living in bad faith, which would be, again, just um, marking time, following a tradition, obeying the status quo. And they're like, no, you have uh, Christ from Dostoevsky's point of view, he has set you free, and it's a terrifying freedom. 
but that f but but we need to take it seriously and and to be responsible so kierkegaard will talk a lot about responsibility um that 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 you are responsible for your life and what comes of it. And, and so take hold of that. And it's not just grasping and groping and grinding. It's, it, it's just saying, you know, if my life matters, uh, what will I do with it? And a lot of these folks, whether atheist, agnostic, or people of faith, they all have this sense that, that death heightens this, that our being before death, remembering your mortality will actually uh, show you the importance of of doing something with your life it makes life precious and and how do you want to spend that and what do you want to present to God when you when you meet him face to face how did you live your life uh, what is it you'll want to say about that well then do that now and that you have you you've been given the freedom to do that even if it if it makes you a little bit uh, agoraphobic and so, so uh, this is a big deal to them. Uh, a classic case of this is in the Brothers Karamazov, where you have a short story within the story called The Grand Inquisitor. And in The Grand Inquisitor, and you can buy that as its own book now, and on, it's online, you can read it there. But in it, uh, uh, Jesus shows up during the Spanish Inquisition, and he heals a little girl. And the local Catholic Inquisitor discovers this, and he has Jesus arrested. And the whole thing is a short story about the, this, this Catholic inquisitor telling Jesus that the freedom he had given us was too overwhelming and people don't want it. And so then he proceeds to justify why the church had to say yes to the three temptations of Satan in, in the wilderness. Jesus had said no. And by his no had set us free. And he says, and the inquisitor says, that's not what the people wanted. So that's not what the church gave them. And we, we said yes to the devil. Um, interestingly, at the end of that, Jesus doesn't argue with him, doesn't say a word. He just kisses him. And this so rattles the inquisitor, he leaves the prison cell. And interestingly, he leaves it open so that Jesus can leave too. I hardly know what to make of that, but it's worth meditating on in terms of a critique of what had happened in the church. And again, a call to freedom and responsibility. Then we have um, that the absurd, as I mentioned before, think of the absurd as non-redemptive suffering in this life. It's what Simone Weil will call affliction. So it's not just suffering. It's when the suffering is so random and so tragic and so uh, that, that, that you you end up um, almost like Simone Weil will say, well, like with pinchers that throw you down, and um, and it's not just evil like wicked people doing stuff. It's like it's really tragic stuff. Like cl the classic would be a grandchild drowning in their in their grandparents' swimming pool, and like there, there's nothing redemptive about that in this life. It's just straight tragedy. And the existentialists remind us that. This is life. <laughs> this is happening to somebody in the world right today. Somebody will starve us and, and it was unnecessary. Somebody will ex experience an assault. Uh, someone will, uh, a wonderful, you know, a good person will develop leukemia. And it's just, oh, tragedy. And what do we do with this? Well, first of all, we don't deny it. We have to look at it and we have to say, the death rate's 100%. So how will we be in this world? And this comes with angst. It comes with anguish. It, it even causes some, like Camus, to say, why not suicide? Why, and why be good? And anyway, what is good? But they don't ask it as rhetorical questions and then wipe their hands and walk away. They really care to say, no, the... There's every reason to think we might consider suicide. You, in fact, you should really consider why not and come up with a, a beautiful answer because you're going to face despair at some point. Um, why be good if you don't believe in God? And you know what? People do. <laughs> Is that just hardwired by God into us? Or can they re give a reason for it? And Camus will. And then what is good? Well, we've... 
uh, we will discover that somehow in the authentic relationships we uh, uh, and living authentically in this life. So this is the last point there. Authenticity, courage to take the leap of faith, to be human, and even to enter into one another's experience with co-suffering love, which is... Um, that's, that is a, an expression you may have heard from me before. I got it from Archbishop Lazar Pahalo, who got it from John, Father John Romanides, who then w was a student of the kind of Russian school that came out of Dostoevsky. And they, so Romanides is the one who said, look at, if you look at all of Dostoevsky's writings together, this is going to be uh, the most the, a common and powerful theme. All right. Well, we've said something about what it is. Uh, I'd like to say a few things where it gets critiqued. And I think sometimes the critiques are fair, but sometimes they're not fair, or it's just more complicated than that. But I, I resonate with some. So yes, there is the danger of a radical individualism that leads to alienation. You have to pay attention to the individual, or as Buber would say, the person as over against the herd, but that can be very isolating. And so you've got to watch out for that because I would regard what Jesus calls as perishing as the problem of alienation. And we really experienced a lot of that. Um, in if, Well, we experienced it in lockdown, right? As the sense of alienation. Uh, some have experienced in their deconstruction having left a faith community or even a family. Uh, but I would also want to point out many of us and many of those I've just described experienced alienation before they left their community, before they did deconstruction, before they experienced lockdown. And so uh, so it's not as simple as saying, well, I, you know, the one who's left a movement is now going to be alienated. Maybe they already were. And maybe it's important that they left, but then we need to take measures in our lives to ensure that we don't get stuck in alienation and that somehow we move towards community, which, which is often uh, the theme in existentialist literature. Uh, radical voluntarism. Voluntarism refers to, uh, to free will. And a kind of radical voluntarism can end up becoming a, a morality of pure will. I do what I want to do. And that can, that can actually sound quite noble. So think about Alice in Wonderland. Uh, they did a movie version, and I'm watching this, and Alice is, Alice is um, discovering freedom. She's discovering herself as a young female individual, and she's not going to listen to the patriarchy anymore, and she's not going to listen to whatever power structures are telling her how she has to live her life. She's going to go live it courageously. Well, how does the movie end? Off she goes on a ship to be a uh, to be a capitalist colonialist that's going to exploit the Far East. And it's like, oh, in your, in your quest to defy the status quo, she actually becomes a slave to it. Why? Well, because that's what that the pure will, a, mor a morality of pure will actually is a kind of slavery. Um, we become enslaved to the demands of the world, the flesh, and the devil. We, um, I will do my thing, I will live my way, is a strange kind of slavery. It's not the freedom for which Christ set us free. Similarly then, radical voluntarism is radical freedom, where Nietzsche says you, he calls us to make self-made values. I think it is important to say, what do you value? What would you die for? What hill would you die on? Um, and that's actually a good process. And although there can be this kind of self-will involved that has Adam and Eve, you know, try to become like God by grasping. Um, at the same time, you know, almost every church plant I know of, and many churches, most hospitals, most businesses, they have a value statement now. That, that's, from, that's from Nietzsche. How, create a value statement. Find out what resonates with you and what matters to you most. But I would just say, we don't actually generate that out of nowhere. That's not really true. <laughs> and if, uh, and then to beware, to beware that in your, in deriving your values, um, that you don't just shift from self will then all the way into the will to power, to uh, because there's always a body count with that. <laughs>
and it's destructive and it's self-destructive. And so the kind of radical freedom that says, I, I will live as I want to live. I'll just follow my heart. Well, I've been watching so many people follow their hearts out of healthy marriages, uh, flourishing families, and faithful communities in, back out into alienation. And that's what I'm talking about, a kind of a critique of radical freedom that would, would do that. And then radical constructionism, what that's talking about is uh, very similar. There is no nature, no essence, no being, except what we assign. And this can, um, this can be seen, well, a, a, a clear example would be, let's say a baby is born. And if the baby's not, doesn't, isn't born with two sets of genitalia, if the doctor will look at it and, 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 and say, okay, that's a baby boy, or that's a baby girl, identifying what is there. But there's a kind of radical constructionism that says, no, the, the doctor assigned that. He just chose. Well, sometimes the doctor makes that choice if there's a medical reason to, um, you know, to do so. And that can be disastrous and painful. Or he doesn't make the choice. And that's disastrous and painful. But most of the time, he's not assigning anything. He's identifying what is. And, and uh, radical constructionism would be a version of existentialism going all the way and saying, no, there's no such thing. There is no there there. I'm, I decide what's there. And I, and, and I suppose, do you think that's what's going on with people said, I'm going to manifest this thing. So I get a desire and then I'm going to manifest it in this world. I suppose that's, that's related by analogy at least, although I can't imagine the uh, the existentialist taking that all that seriously. All right, now we shift to literature. Existentialist, um, existentialism is very much about literature. It's not about generally about philosophical textbooks. It's novels, a lot of fiction. Why fiction? Why novels? Well, the existentialist saw the power of narrative and how narrative can get past the watchful dragons of, of heady and abstract principles. And so it embeds, it embeds the ideas in real life where we discover those ideas. And it's a rhetorical strategy um, similar to Jesus' parables where, where in story form, in fiction form, you, you, you give a narrative and somehow that narrative then moves truth from your head to your heart to your hands. It's transformative. And that's why Jesus used parables. They, a powerful rhetorical strategy for transformation. And the existentialists saw this. And they, they saw, um, the ones who believed in truth, they saw fiction as a powerful, a powerful delivery system for truth. Uh, far more than, well, think about why, why weren't the Gospels written in point form? You know, it's a story because life matters. Existence is the context in which meaning happens. And so... So we've got these novels. And these novels, the existentialist novels, they, they make some assertions by um, just by the stories they tell. So what, here's some assertions. Real life is hard. And people are layered. And could people die terribly? And the wicked do prosper. And it's complicated. And there's a thrownness that is... Uh, we've been thrown into into lives we didn't pick. You didn't pick your parents. You didn't pick where you would live. You didn't pick, um, you know, the what class you you have been thrown into. It's it. There's this thrownness, but in the midst of the of the absurdity and the randomness of being thrown into a situation, it's in there that we find meaning. And they're going to on this quest for meaning. So, these books are about that. People looking to engage life to find meaning. Uh, in the context of stories that begin to resonate with our stories. And so I want to just point out a few of these um, things to watch for as you're reading your novel. So I know that you're reading either Crime and Punishment or The Plague and not both, but I'm going to give you enough information that I hope that you will read the other book at some point out um, and you have a clue what the other students are experiencing. Um, so the basic plot of Crime and Punishment is that we have a young man named Raskolnikov, and he is pretty angsty, but he, he and, and very moody, and he has come to the conclusion that, that he needs to rise above good and evil and to test 
some of his grandiose ideas that if he could find a perfectly worthless person, that he would be able to murder that perfectly worthless person. And he starts playing with the idea as a thought experiment, but it becomes an obsession. And then he runs into a an older woman who's a, she's really a completely unsavory, cranky. Um, you, you just wouldn't like her and he doesn't like her. And so he, he figures out, you know, she's, she's worthless and, and worthy of death. And so he's going to do, he's going to do her in. And, um, and this will somehow prove, prove to himself that he is beyond good and evil and that, that he's special in that way. And that one of our students has, has challenged that and said, there's something else going on here. Maybe this is his last way to grope for meaning. Um, he at least is going to try. Well, what he discovers, what I want you to watch for, is how his conscience does not let him away with it. He botches the murder. I hate to give too many spoilers here, but in botching the murder, uh, there's a collateral damage to a sweet person. And and this really begins to torment him. His conscience acts as judge. So this is one of the things Dostoevsky is doing for us. He's saying, I want you to uh, watch how his conscience condemns him and won't let him off the hook. And in fact, he begins to develop fevers and even uh, delirium and because he is fragmented inside. And and so we have this the, the tormented man who, whose conscience stands over him as judge. We also have grace in the midst of this. Um, Raskolnikov, though he's done this terrible thing, he also runs into an alcoholic and and he develops a heart for their family. And how, how does this happen? Well, the alcoholic's name is Marmeladov and he's a terrible person too. He, he, um, he has a family, but he's neglectful and he's lost his job and he's drowning in sorrows and alcohol. But it, his family's starving, and in fact, um, the the two little children are are sick and they need medicine, and and so one of his underage daughters, uh, in her in her desire to get medicine for her little siblings, actually you know be, becomes a sex trade worker just to pay for the medicine, um, and he lets this happen. He sees it happening. It's worse than that. He steals her money for the medicine and goes and drinks it up. It, um, we're going to see, he, he ends up dying and somehow Raskolnikov begins to feel in his fragment itself responsible for their family and he wants to help. So that's very strange. He's done this thing over here, but now maybe this is a way to do penance or is it authentic? Whatever. What I want to expose you to today is, is a speech by Marmoladov before he dies. So I'm going to open that up here. He's in a bar and he's and he's he's really feeling self-loathing. Uh, you might not be able to read this. I'll read it for you. What well, maybe you should picture that if you want to close your eyes. You're in this noisy Russian pub in Saint Petersburg, and you've got Raskolnikov is sidled up to a, a table, and, and and there's people surrounding them too, and and just lots of noise and lots of chatter and lots of talk, but. Marmeladov starts uh, he, in he's pretty drunk and he he goes off and people are listening and he's and, and he's talking about how pitied he he, sh he is and he shouldn't be pit don't pity me and he says this to be pitied why am I to be pitied why am I to be pitied you say yes there's nothing to pity me for I ought to be crucified, crucified on a cross, not pitied. Crucify me, O oh judge, crucify me, but pity me. And then I will go of myself to be crucified, for it's not merrymaking I seek, but tears and tribulation. Do you suppose that, um, that, that, Sal, that this pint of yours has been sweet to me? It was tribulation I sought at the bottom of it, tears and tribulation. I found it and I've tasted it, but he, capital H, so this is Christ, he will pity us who has had pity on all men, who has understood all men and all things. He is the one. He too is the judge. He will come in that day and he will ask, where's the daughter who gave herself for her cross? 
consumptive stepmother and for the little children of another. Where is the daughter who had pity upon the filthy drunkard, her earthly father, undismayed by his beastliness? And he will say, come to me. I've already forgiven thee once. I've forgiven thee once. Thy sins, which are many, are forgiven thee, for thou hast loved much. And he will forgive my Sonia. He will forgive. I know it. That's the, 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 the girl who's the sex worker. I felt it in my heart when I was with her just now. And he will judge and he will forgive all the mercy and the evil, the wise and the meek. And when he is done with all of them, then he will summon us. You too come forth, he will say. Come forth, ye drunkards. Come forth, ye weak ones. Come forth. Come forth, ye children of shame. And we shall all come forth without shame and shall stand before him. And he will say to us, you are swine made in the image of the beast and with his mark, but come ye also. The wise ones and those of understanding will say, O Lord, why dost thou receive these men? And he will say, this is why I receive them, O ye wise. This is why I receive them, O ye of understanding, that not one of them believed himself to be worthy of this. And he will hold out his hands to us and we will fall down before him and we shall weep. And we shall understand all things, and then we shall understand all. And we will understand Katerina Ivanov even, that's his, his wife. She will understand, Lord, that kingdom come. And he sank down on the bench, exhausted, helpless, looking at no one, apparently oblivious of his surroundings, plunged in deep thought, and his, his words had created a certain impression. There was a moment of silence, but soon laughter and those were heard again. Ah, that's his notion. He talked himself silly. So... Uh, that's quite profound in the sense of you get this picture of radical grace in the midst of severe affliction and tragedy and even wickedness. And, um, and so, um, I'm sorry, let's come back down here. And so we've got Mermelod of he's grace even for the disqualified because they know they're disqualified. And um, this is something to think about as we, when we approach the communion table, uh, we come not because we're worthy, but because we're not, and because we're in need of the medicine of immortality that's in the chalice, you know. So Marmolada gets a little picture of this. The question is, is that too much, you know? Is, or is he the exception to grace, or is he the test case? We also have a policeman who named Porphyry, and I want you to watch out for him in the book. And so this policeman is trying to find out who murdered the, 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 the women, and he has a hint that it's Raskolnikov, and he's in pursuit, and he, like, over and over again, he's pursuing him, and weirdly, Raskolnikov just kind of wants to be caught, and he keeps going, and he keep, he'll confess in a pub, and someone overhears him, or he'll go to Raskolnikov, and he'll say, thing, or to, to Porphyry, the policeman, he'll say, you know, I, why don't you just accuse me, and, and, and just get out, get it out, and because his conscience is accusing him, and so he wants the policeman to accuse him, so he can kind of be relieved, but the cop won't do it. And, and he's like, well, I think there's something you want to tell me. Why don't you just confess? It's like, I won't confess. I'll never confess. You have to catch me, but what, you know I did it. You know, this, what's Porphyry up to? Well, he had enough evidence to charge and arrest and have, have, uh, Raskolnikov sentence, but he doesn't want to. He wants to save him, and he knows that if he can, if he can corner him into a authentic confession, then it will save his soul. And so this is this is subtly the idea of of the policeman as priest, and and that a priest is not to be a policeman. A priest is to save our souls. So it's even made perhaps a bit of a critique on on the misuse of confession as if the, the priest thinks he's a policeman. No, be like Porphyry. Um, reach out to people. Ha, w draw them towards authenticity, to confession, to salvation in that sense. And I was so frustrated when, when, before I could see that. I'm like, why don't you just arrest him? You know he did it. It's like, that's a good question. Here's why. Uh, because it's not about catching and punishing someone. It is about saving them from the consequences of their sins. And in fact, some translations, the book is actually titled Sin and Consequences rather than Crime and Punishment because the consequence 
it, the judgment is intrinsic to the sin and, and to the, the, the torment of the conscience and to the necessity of confession. Well, in the end, it, it's not perfect Porphyry who's going to be able to rescue him. Oddly, it's this underage sex worker who is a precious little girl and and uh, Raskolnikov run, runs into her and and uh, the first time he goes to see her, I, I think maybe he's even going to hire her, but he gets into her place and he just doesn't want to. And he has her read uh, from the gospel and she reads the story of the resurrection of Lazarus and it really hits him. And you can see already... Uh, that theme then in the book is, he, could there even be uh, a, a, a spiritual resurrection for someone who has really committed moral suicide through this murder? And and um, and she will watch him, and she sees how sad he is. Or so, but he, but he's disconnected from it. He's cold hearted. He's defiant. But actually, she's able to empathize. And when she weeps for him. And he sees her tears. That's her tears are what plow his heart to begin a softening. And she's going to end up. Uh, she's going to end up being able to to convince him of the need for confession. And she begs him to confess, like the police officer did. But it's it's her tears that have the power of co-suffering love to transform his heart. And and ultimately, she will even follow him. Um, through his confession, his arrest, and his pun he's sent to Siberia, and she she follows him. It's a beautiful love story in that sense of um, not a romance story at all, but uh, agape love, you know, a cruciform love that actually saves a man who's who's ruined his own life by ruining others. You know, so. That's a bit about crime and punishment. For those who've read or are reading the novel, again, watch for these things. Watch for the conscience, feverish. Watch for this radical grace, even through expressed through horrible people. Watch through for the, 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 what the policeman's up to, and then watch for Sonia and her tears and her empathy and the power of it to, and how it affects different people in the story. All right, let's shift over now to the plague. And the basic plot of the plague. So the basic plot is that we're in northern Algeria in a city called Oran. It is a walled city. It's near the Mediterranean Ocean. And one day there's, there's rats starting to die. And then more and more rats. And in, in ugly, really bad ways such that some people start noticing. <laughs> and then there's piles of rats. And, and, um, and eventually this... They, this plague will begin to spread to people. And again, and it, it's a little bit like uh, when COVID hit us, um, where at first you're watching it and you're living your normal life and it's a thing you see in the news. And then you even start hearing numbers that are alarming, but you still go out for dinner. You still go to, you know, save on foods to buy your groceries. You still, you know, life hasn't changed so much. And then, and then the... Um, and then the ER wards start filling up and overfilling. And then people you know are affected. And before we had vaccines, the, the amount that were intubated and died. This is going on in the plague. It's the Black Plague. Um, and it's spreading again. And they just start trying everything. And, and, and uh, eventually... <clears throat> The plague is going to run its course, but not before it's killed a lot of people and that they've discovered a lot of their approaches were ineffective. And so that's familiar to us. It did feel rather clever that I assigned this book probably two months before COVID hit in the last a couple of years ago. And um, and and it was powerful to, to compare that book to what was happening in our lives and to see how the, we have these... Uh, kind of reactions to it that vary across the board. And each of the characters then in, in this book is going to respond to that, the lockdown. They actually quarantine the whole city so you can't get in or out. It's it's a walled city. And and what's that going to mean? And how will you live in that? And what, what happens to your job? Do you go to your job? What happens to your family? What happens if you get sick? <coughs> Can you escape the city? Should you escape the city and spread this to the rest of the world? 
So these are questions that come up in the book. So if you're reading The Plague, it's it's just, <laughs> uh, I've read it, I've, every time I read it, I see more, but here's some things to watch for if you're one of the students reading now, and maybe some reasons to read it later if you're not. So again, you've got the absurd in tragedy and this the and being before death. So it really shows up, especially, um, uh, we've got a doctor named Dr. Rue, and he's treating folks, and 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 you see how like really lovely people can catch the plague, and even if they're careful, and you've got people who 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 actually become opportunists in the midst of the plague, and it's just so ugly, and it's part of the tragedy that that we would take advantage of 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 human tragedy and then add moral wickedness on it, and. And so you see this kind of ab absurdity, but also how uh, the various characters um, um, are confronted with mortality in a way that they now they have to say, how am I going to be? What, how will I live in the face of death when de when death isn't a thing I can put off or deny anymore? But I, I see it. I see it in the street this morning again, you know. That affects how you live and it's meant to. And that's kind of the function of existential literature. Um, it's really fascinating to see how each character um, responds so differently to the plague. So you've got some who just like are willful denial. Um, you've got some, uh, one felt, one of the characters who he's been a murderer. He's a criminal. He's going to be caught. He's nervous about being caught. And now all of a sudden, no one cares. <laughs> and this, this plague kind of gives him a newfound freedom. And that newfound freedom actually begins to change his character. It's very interesting. We've got another character who he's just so he, he was so dis, disillusioned by his father being a judge who sent someone to the death penalty that he'd gone and joined this activist movement. And then they end up mobbing and killing somebody. And, and, and he's and he's just so sick of death. And now now he's here. And it's like, what would it be when you've rejected um, the let's say the death dealing on the on the political right, and then you join the, the ideological left, and they're doing the same stuff. And, you, and, and he, he wants to transcend that and find goodness elsewhere than in movements. Ah, individual freedom and responsibility for goodness. Um, watch also how the plague is a metaphor, intentionally so, um, for Camus. It was a plague of ideas specific to Hitlerism. And so... The characters are responding to the plague in ways he saw the German populace uh, responding to Hitler and what he was doing, and and so you have those who just went about life as if nothing was going on. They were in, they wanted to be in denial and could be of the death camps. Um, others become collaborators. Others join the resistance. Others. Um, battle this in violent ways, and others in subtle undermining ways and and but but as the ideas rip through like a plague it's disturbing to see how many people found what hitler was doing kind of reasonable or well you know he does have, he does have some good policies you know does that fam sound familiar to anybody uh this and and especially then um, from my point of view that the tragedy of of how the churches became part of um, responsibility to Hitler because in some cases uh, Mennonite farmers who were going to lose their farms now had Hitler um, veto the, the bank foreclosures and he saved their farms. What will this mean now when there's a death camp 14 kilometers away? I'm speaking of a real instance, uh, a friend of mine who experienced this. And uh, his uncle was a pastor who said no and he was put under house arrest gratefully not um, sent to a camp but uh, how will the church respond to this and is it going to be the christians that are the good guys and the non-christians are the bad guys well camus knows that's not how it works so he's got dr rue as kind of a hero in the story and he's a good man he's a good doctor he's an agnostic like like Camus, and he, but he doesn't even worry about high-minded thinking. He doesn't have time. He's dealing with the patient in front of him. And he's 
he wants to save that one. And why do you, why do you bother? Why do you bother when everybody's dying? And in fact, why take care of this dying child when he's going to die? And he's like, to be human. Um, if we don't pursue the good in the midst of great tragedy, we actually lose our humanity itself. That's, that's the thing we're trying to say. We're not, we can't solve a plague. We can't solve a fascist dictatorship. What we have to solve is whether I'm going to stay human in it or not. Will I opt out in despair? Will I turn into the monster I want to destroy? Or is there somehow that, that I could live, and let's just say to live as Christ would in the midst of suffering, and in fact put your own life on the line. Um, and so... And not know if, if will the good doctor die of the plague or will he survive the plague? There's, there's just no guarantee because life is absurd, but in the midst of that meaning. I also then just finally, I want to mention Father Panelo. He's a priest and he's he's transformed through this book. He preaches two sermons and the first one's just terrible. It's like he's basically saying, look, this must be God's judgment. And it makes sense that God would send his judgment because you're you guys are sinners. And uh, the solution is that you, you need to repent and you need to realize this was this is your fault somehow. And uh, and then he's also kind of tr trying to deal with the problem of evil just rationally in a way that disregards the, the tragedy to human life. So he's like a really good example of, of how bad, um, you know, this must be a lesson kind of theology is. Later in the book, we hear him say, give a second sermon. And in the second sermon, and this is the tricky thing, someone, someone should write a book on this, how Panelo's second sermon, uh, he's actually channeling Simone Weil's work, which Camus had so respected. And so, so in the second sermon, he, he's recognizing that the reality of affliction and that it is part of... It is part of, of the created order where we face um, these kind of things as necessity that we can't change or fix or overcome, but we can be uh, we can be faithful in the midst of it. And that second sermon is fairly profound. It's also it pushes you because um, well he's just he doesn't let us off any hook. And it's like what will you do with your life now if in the face of an affliction that has now impacted all of us, and there's no one to blame, not even ourselves. How shall we then live? And the result is, um, um, he, after that sermon, he lives his faith and actually um, he gives his life for others in trying to take care of them through the plague. Well, I've gone on quite a long time, but hopefully this will give you a bit of an introduction to, you know, we've got the... Um, the founding fathers of existentialism, key voices in the 20th century, the way that we have um, key narratives, even though they're different uh, across the existentialist board, uh, some of those key belief systems and how these show up in the plague and in crime and punishment. So do watch for those themes as you read the book. And I hope that you will consider reading the other novel that you didn't read, and then just go even deeper. These are some marvelous authors, but that's it for this week.